Good morning. We are here today with Irina. I would like to throw it over to you to introduce yourself. Ah, hi, I'm Irina. I'm a loving person. I'm a mother uh, of two, or really three, mm -hmm. uh, my two girls and my partner's boy. I've had a few different challenging experiences and through by overcoming those, I learned a few different tools and skills. And now I put them in place through my own um, holistic therapy business to help others to feel empowered about their well-being. Mm -hmm. I love that, to feel empowered about their well-being. Lots of synergy. Mm -hmm. Thank you for joining us. Um, okay. <laughs> Share with me what is one mental health tactic that you yourself use just to help support, you know, not every day is going to be great, but what's one tactic you go to to help your well-being? One thing that I, I like to pull out of the bag when, when um, particularly if there's like a panic rising up is these three words that have saved me many times and it's I am safe. I say that to myself in my mind and then as I grow in courage I say it out loud I've had a lot of um, difficult experiences around being able to breathe and being able to use my voice so when I'm able to speak that out loud it just reminds me that it's okay mm -hmm. that I'm here and that I'm able to reconnect I don't need to run I don't need to hide. Um, I don't need to fight. I can just be here in my body <laughs> yeah. and be able to move forward from there. Yeah, that's really beautiful. It's kind of like taming that old primitive brain, the fight or flight, and you can feel it, but still it's okay to just, sit in it perhaps or you know control it so you don't have to respond yeah that's very beautiful. yeah exactly mm -hmm. I think that's a lot to do with it because oftentimes if like you know there's an overwhelming flood of emotions that mm -hmm. rush through like my body when I'm in different situations yeah. it's just nice to come back and to know that I can tell myself it's all right. I've got this. Yeah, mm. that's beautiful. Fantastic. Um, the next question as part of the campaign is, what is your message of hope? That initially, uh, that question, the reason it was uh, designed in this campaign is, you know, many of us have overcome so much adversity. There could be some people who are experiencing it right now. There could be some people who are unfamiliar with that um, that technique that you just described and are in the panic or the fight flight state. And I'm just curious, like, what is some insight that you have for them? Is there a message of hope that you can share that, you know, maybe could have been helpful to you or just, or just some insight that you would like to share with them? I think that during the the dark cloudy days that I had and I was in a lot of fog uh, particularly after I had my second child and I had severe postnatal depression I think that I just really needed to know that um, being where I was was okay that I didn't need to do everything at once mm -hmm. that I just needed to really um, sit and accept support mm -hmm. and that um, I used to do, I used to do something actually like if I if I was um, having difficulty getting out of bed or um, moving around and things like that I'd write myself a list and I think that's um, it's really different when you start to create your own momentum and movement to heal. Mm -hmm. So I want people to know that's probably that my main message of hope, actually, switching yeah. back and forth, but my main yeah. message of hope is that healing is possible. Mm -hmm. 
healing is possible and hope is allowed and you can live your life with joy mm. and be resilient the challenges that come along it's like my, my main message that I usually tell people so anyway back to my story mm. is I used to write a list and my list I would write before I went to sleep and on my list I would have get up get mm. dressed those are the first two things that I would put on my list mm. and then I would have all these other things sometimes I would get up and I wouldn't tick off get dressed it was just too much for that day mm. but I would have something to eat and then I would come back and I wouldn't need to think too much through the haze because yeah. I'd already put it in a list and I just had to keep looking back at the list because I'd already told myself what I needed to do so I didn't yeah. need to like try and figure it out through the haze yeah mm. for sure I just got goosebumps from that I think what I resonated with is just like for anyone who might not have had that experience of um of have, have been experienced mental health issues it may not necessarily understand sometimes how hard it is just to get out of bed you know it's like just do this one thing today or just you know put your clothes on or have that list on standby so that even if that step was taken that's an accomplishment for that day um yeah. mm. and you get so, to tick it off <laughs> yeah right I off might and have you're to like yes I did that <laughs> owned it <laughs> no I love it and um it's finding whatever's going to work for you you know in our own individual journeys mm. I think that's it. like sometimes I see all these uh programs and steps in place and it's and it's wonderful when you're caught up into that motion, but it's mm. like when you're starting from, you know, if you're feeling, you know, suicidal, you have suicidal ideation, like I've been through that. And I know that um, it's really your mind is all foggy and your breath and your body is reacting in different ways. And it's hard to just have a start of, okay, I just need to take a tiny step and it doesn't even need to be forward. It just mm. kind of needs to be even some little motion to get it started. Because once you're started, that's yeah. when you can move. Yeah, mm. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's like the hardest part is just getting started sometimes. Mm. Mm. Fantastic. Now, um, you did just mention just briefly there that, yes, you have had some firsthand experience. This is a suicide prevention um, initiative. I'm just really curious to see if people are comfortable sharing you know, I know I myself have been in that instance before and I noticed it was just there was this one direct action that absolutely helped over all of the other actions. You know, I found, for example, um, within my own experience of post-traumatic stress, there were people around me that wanted to be there to listen and, you know, listening was helpful. But what I actually needed was to break that pattern and um, one of the action steps that helped me was... Uh, one person had intervened by handing me the trauma counsellor business card and telling me to go to the doctor. And, you know, that was a very significant step that actually helped break that continuous cycle of emotions that I was going through. So I'm just curious, uh, do you have any tips or insights or action steps that helped you in that time? Or maybe if you've helped other people go through that experience, what type of insight do you think um, you can provide for us today? Hmm. It is such a scary place to be in. Yeah, yeah to, to really have that um, idea that that is an option, that that is mm. your only option. And I think that through different stages where that has um, come up into my mind and been around me I've found that running away from that really didn't help yeah. like trying to drink my way out of it drank a lot to get away oh, from yeah. it like you know use different substances like I used a lot of things to try and run from myself yeah and I think it really did come down to being able to just find a lot more 
acceptance around that. I know like other people have different ideas, but for me, that's what helped me. I'm going to talk about myself rather than mm-hmm. I'll talk about myself and then I'll talk about how I would help yeah. others. So for myself, sure. I find um, suicidal ideation comes up every now and again. It flares up for me in different spaces, different things that happen. And I just have a lot more acceptance around that happening. Like I just, I'm like, okay, uh, I think that has a lot to do because I do a lot of meditation as well. Is that it's coming, it's coming to my mind. Okay, it is there. Now it can go. Mm-hmm. Like I, that's how I, that's how I let it be. Yeah. I let it be. So that's how I um, find that really helps because I don't attach anything onto it I don't be like oh my gosh okay now that it's coming catastrophe Mm -hmm. like I need to do like bring someone get support rada rada because um unfortunately at the moment that's just that can be a part of my life and I'm okay with that Mm -hmm. I'm okay because I have I have a lot of support networks and things in place for me but Mm -hmm. that's what I for me sorry oh sorry I was just gonna say to me it sounds like there's definitely increased self-awareness there you know you mentioned through meditation and practice so you're building skills and the second thing that um that I think is really helpful that you've pointed out is that you've got these massive support systems around you too you know building that in helps if you build that in on a good day it helps definitely if you're feeling a bad day and I like how you said that because oftentimes like people are reaching out when they're when they're at that, you know, yeah, or, crisis at sense. that stage where they're just mm-hmm. like completely overwhelmed. Mm-hmm. And that and I love that this that this initiative where we're talking about taking steps to put in place prevention, you know, prevention mm-hmm. before we get to that stage so that we can get in there early and build those support networks, build a foundation of um, resilience in your body, like build on those different skills so that, you know, we don't need to let people get to that stage. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no, I hear you for sure. And um, you wanted to just share a little bit of insights of how you've helped other people too? Oh, yes. So I think that um, a lot of the time, what I find with other people is that they really just need someone to sit there Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. listen to them, to deeply listen, not to give them advice, Mm -hmm. not to tell them what to do, just to listen, just to listen and witness and be there yeah it's so important. and then when they're ready you can see like there's a little there's a little change in them there's a little like little little bit of a spark of their 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 wanting their wanting of life when you mm. see that it's when you can offer oh there, there's this available there's this available, yeah. there's this available right? but mm. I think like getting to that stage where they're in that space of readiness mm. to move through it that's Ooh. yeah I'd like to wait for that I am so glad you mentioned that because, you know, uh, I find, for example, a lot of businesses come to me in high-end complicated needs. So it could be at-risk situations, someone's been harmed to themselves or others. Give me all the, you know, give me all the quick fixes. How do we snap them out of it? How do we make sure it doesn't happen again or prevent it from getting worse? And it's like, well, part of it actually is that individual needs to be ready for that change. That's so hard for someone on the outside to comprehend, you know, that person's journey is in their own time frame, and it may be, yeah, I just love what you said in terms of finding those small moments where you see that spark because uh, they are the moments that you can actually intervene and make a difference. Forcing it onto people, you know, is just going to build resistance away or, you know, uh, and I love that you said uh, build a space to listen, which is very hard, like, uh, as an outsider trying to support someone or care for someone, you know, you're hurting too sometimes and you just want to shift that process of let's get there sooner, (laughs) you know, Um, and actually, you know, you can't force that. It's just you don't want to give up on them 
but being able to be present in a space to listen unconditionally non-biased judgment I don't know what you're going through I don't know what pain you're carrying but I will be here for that moment that you are ready you know um so thank you so much for that insight Mm. Mm. you're making me teary (laughs) no no, look I want to just um share one more little yeah, yeah no just tears of joy as in joy in terms of there was beauty in that not sadness um Mm -hmm. I just want to share one other insight that I think may be helpful for people if they haven't found a safe space to have these chats before is you did mention reaching out to drugs and alcohol and Mm -hmm. I just want to reflect just on my own experience yet those that know me yes I have gone through post-traumatic stress disorder and I do remember some of the hardest days where I did reach out to alcohol to numb that pain it was so intense and you know I now have that empathy and understanding for people who may be finding those pathways of drugs and alcohol as an escapism and I'm fortunate I was able to break out of those cycles but I guess yeah I just wanted to share that that is um it is a coping mechanism that some people do and sometimes it delays that help and I guess just emphasizing or resonating why I feel and believe like my mission's important for the children and young people because if they reach out to drugs and alcohol too early in their lifespan it can be a lifelong huge battle to just overcome some of the basics they were originally hiding from so um bring it on for prevention right (laughs) and I think that's that's the other thing like if you look at um you know addictions in general like there's all different kinds right Mm -hmm. um if you look at that as another way of uh flight being in action you know it is a way to escape it is a way to run away it is a way to not face what is really happening inside and that's why I really like to help people to process those different emotions because Mm -hmm. a lot of times like we've well what I've been finding is that people that come to me they're they're scared of being scared they're scared of being angry you know and like I just really encourage people to look at emotions in a different perspective like we've got a whole spectrum of emotions and Mm. and that's really normal that's what makes us human you know and it's just how do we let those emotions flow through in a healthy way rather than and destruction destructive patterns like um using Mm. alcohol and things to not feel what we're feeling Mm. you know so yeah yeah Um, it's really it's really I um, love what you said there in terms of we're scared of the emotions Um, and Mm -hmm. I can you know I've got a few men for example in my network close close to me like true trusted people in my network but that have verbalized that fear of not wanting the emotional intensity because it uh, that fear of what happens if I let it all out because it's going to be so extreme that what if you know I can't make my way back out of it it's just interesting because playing that what if game just delays it from coming out making it even more intense because it is still there somewhere that needs to be processed um so absolutely what you do helping people with that emotional journey is very important Yeah, I think like, especially if there's like a lot of like big, you know, lived experiences that have been like traumatic or challenging or adverse, you know, like at times with those emotions, that emotional body, it can seem too much. And that's when you can get those supports in place. Mm. Like I love to do that. But you can get supports in place to be able to express them, you know, like so that you don't feel, you don't have to do those, um, those big I call them the icky feelings the icky feelings (laughs) and you don't need to go through that alone like processing those big emotions like having that that um those things swirling around you Mm. can really um be let out and and, in a a safe space like with a safe person do you know what I mean and once you allow yourself to kind of sit in there 
with somebody else to support you, you'll feel more ready to um, gather up resilience to be able to do it by yourself. Yeah, 100%. You know? And I don't know, just in case this tip is helpful to anyone out there, I do recall part of my journey when I did finally get professional treatment. Um, one tactic that I did just to help myself with that journey, I guess, is every time I had like a counselling session, I would book in like a, a date with one of my girlfriends at the time and would have coffee and cake or something like soon after. So I didn't have to kind of like, if I was emotionally affected, I didn't have to sit with that. And I had someone trusted in my network that I could um, deliberately catch up with to take me out of that um, dwelling if that's uh, the mode I'm in. So yeah, there's all sorts of tactics you can do to help make that journey a little bit lighter. Um, which is hard when you're in that haze to think about, but these are certainly great steps or suggestions for someone who's never been through that before that you can help advise to help get them or whoever in their network through it. Yeah, I found like I had a big shift in my healing pathway when I moved from talking therapy. I, I never really mm. had a lot of um, uh, time. I, I, don't really verbalize a lot of things yep. and so that was really tricky for me because I found every time I was just like I don't know that there's no words yep. that come out and I have a better understanding now that really like my language center was just shut down and it just wasn't mm. that kind of therapy just didn't help me yeah. so when I moved into like um creative therapy and movement therapy and mm. being able to move and express in different ways that's when I was like oh so now that I've done that now I can talk about it yeah, because I right. had to go through the senses to be able to get there yeah, so, <laughs> yeah. no that's brilliant so that, was, that was a pivotal moment for me that's that's why I started to do what I do now yeah because okay. I'm, oh, if I'm like that there must be heaps of other people <laughs> yeah yeah I mean you're talking to a huge advocate here for arts and health initiatives right and there's yeah. so much value that creative arts can bring especially in this healing journey um yeah. and you're bringing it to light someone that is has never been uh who's hopefully touch wood they've never had to see a health professional before but if they have to you know often the clinical pathway is the first option that is handed to people and uh young people for example I mean I come from a theater background geez if I was given the option to do drama therapy I reckon I would have loved it but I you know <laughs> I did it I wasn't knowledgeable about that practice existed I wasn't necessarily knowledgeable about how to get onto that pathway and some of these mm. are barriers for people to um, reach out to these alternate uh, steps. So mm. I'm just wondering for you, could you just share with us if someone was interested in perhaps exploring a creative arts therapy pathway, what would you, what would you advise them? How do they do that? Oh, to come and see me. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, to come and see you would be fantastic. But even just thinking of that perspective, a family who's struggling uh, with someone within their tight neck, they, they think that someone could benefit from uh, creative arts therapy. How do they do that? Because it's, can they go to the GP and, and request it that way? Or is it that they have to find private practice? Yeah, just provide a little bit of insight. Yeah, that's an interesting one because there's different pathways to do that. If you go mm -hmm. through um, your GP, then you can, they usually have different sort of reach out to an art therapy. Uh, art therapy is very much involved in the um, traditional Western medicine like pathway uh, for complementary therapies and alternative therapies, which is my space. Mm -hmm. uh, you would need to have a look for creative therapies that are more involved with meditation mm -hmm. um, and holistic health, because that's where I, I like to work in the holistic health um sector because I believe that we are uh different parts of us need to 
be looked at as a whole so you know mind body emotions and spirit Mm -hmm. so I like to work with the idea that people are an interconnected being so Mm -hmm. I like to tailor it so that they feel more aligned with their whole Mm well-being rather than they have more of a um, structure around um, mind mind, uh, and looking at the body and certain structures involved Mm -hmm. there so it depends on what kind of pathway I really encourage people to feel empowered about looking at um, their pathway to well-being it could be a combination of both Mm -hmm. Uh, that's just my my view I I really believe in people's ability to choose and to explore Mm -hmm. because I did explore in different avenues um, different I've been on a healing path for a very very long time and Mm. I just found that um, the traditional side of um, uh, general doctors and things like that really didn't help um, me to move forward so Mm. yeah like I I think that people should uh, if things are not progressing for you to feel that you're finding moments of joy and finding times where you can build up resilience to challenges that come along Mm -hmm. then perhaps you do need to look at different pathways to heal yeah Mm. such an important message Mm. that answers (laughs) that oh no it does it really does it's I mean providing insight to the general public because some people have Mm. never ever experienced this before they may not even know what holistic you know healing is I know like a lot of our first nations aboriginal Torres Strait Islander you know health system looks holistically about well-being and it's so important and it's just to put it out there that there are actually different pathways not all of them are going to suit you pointed that out in your story I know Mm. one of the treatments that actually worked for me is the rapid eye movement one the trauma yeah 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 yeah, yeah. and I know that even there's some controversy there because only some practitioners do it not all practitioners do it and all of that um you know clinical evidence base you know some experimental treatments absolutely work you know it's just a matter of finding what works for you Mm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Okay, my last Mm. question to you is if people would like to get in touch, how do they do that? (laughs) Yay! (laughs) So if you want to come and see me, I work online and I work um, in my healing space here in my um, residence and I also run different workshops around and about so if you are interested in finding out more about how I empower people to shine as the authentic truth, mm-hmm. then you can go to my website, www.lanternholistics.com mm-hmm. and uh, send me a message. I love to connect with people, even just if, you know, if, if they come into my space, I love to invite people into my heart And I love to share Mm. that connection with people. So even Mm. if like we might not be the right match, I'm always like, you know, able to find different avenues for them. But I think, you know, if people are drawn to me, then that's um, that's always a good start so that we can look. How can we serve? How can I serve you? (laughs) Mm, That's brilliant. Thank Mm. you so much for your time. And thank you for being part of this 100 Stories campaign. Oh, thank you so much. I'm so, so very grateful to be here. I'm really excited about being involved in a movement to help people to find their way in life. Yeah. Yay, thank you. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you for having me. <laughs> we will be in touch and we'll share more stories shortly. Talk soon. <laughs>